All right, I am David Block. Um, I teach at uh, El Dorado High School. I am not a district teacher. I work with North Orange County ROP. And um, so, uh, but I've been assigned to El Dorado for now going my sixth year um, and my seventh year teaching. And so I teach um, digital design and illustration, visual communications, advanced graphic design and honors graphic design. Um, and I have a design rescue program that is a it's an on campus kind of a studio that my advanced uh, it's staffed by my advanced kids. I'll tell you more about that if you want, but we can move on. So who would like to Ali, can you tell, tell us about yourself? Um, I'm Ali Cowan. I live in Portland, Oregon. I teach in Vancouver, Washington. Um, and I've been I started as a fine arts teacher and switched to graphic design CTE. And um, I teach a beginning and an advanced course. Excellent. Thanks. Oh, and sorry, I'm in uh, Southern California. I don't know if I said that. Michelle? Hey, um, I'm Michelle Clement. Um, I live in uh, north of Baton Rouge, and um, I teach at a small private school. Um, I was an engineer in a prior life and started teaching computer science. And um, this is our first year to do graphic design at our school. And I am learning from the ground up. I have no books, no curriculum. I am just trying to figure out what I'm doing. And I start on Friday. So <laughs> I'm looking for any help I can get. Well, you're in the right place. <laughs> yeah, I've been following you for a while. We, we thought we were going to get this last year and we didn't get enough people signed up so this year, the classmate. And um, so I've got a lot of information i just got to figure out how to how to present it i guess absolutely <laughs> all right thanks carissa um i'm carissa sheehan i work i live in like northwest arkansas um so i got my little razorbacks <laughs> um i've mostly been a graphic designer in my career um for nonprofits, and for the, i'm in my second year second full year teaching. Um, I teach graphic design, um, Photoshop, um, and I'm adding in an advanced graphics this year. And I'm, I do it, it's completely online. So I teach um, high school kids who are mostly homeschooled kids. And then, so that's been kind of nice in all of this that's happened. It didn't really change my teaching that much. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So my name is Bill Mayer. I live outside of Portland, Oregon, a little town called Tigard, and I teach at West Salem High School uh, down in Salem, which is our state capital. I teach uh, what's called digital arts curriculum. I teach photography, graphic design, animation, and video production. So I got the gamut. I've got three levels of digital arts. I got two levels of video production and then um, one animation. So I, I keep busy. Oh, I'm also a CTE too. So, yes, Ali mentioned CTE. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah. Thank Excellent. You. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, so, all right. Where to begin? So, here's now. Typically, I I don't. Um, first of all, I just want to start off. I don't know anything. Okay. <laughs> I am not. I don't have answers to anything. Um, so, I just want to share with you what I do, and you guys, I'd like to hear what you do, and you know, let's just figure out what. Who's, who's doing what and what works best for who. So um, essentially what I've got is, um, let me just pull open, as just as a starting point, uh, my files or the, my resources, I should say. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, make sure I'm sharing the right thing. There we go, okay, great. Uh, now, generally, uh, I keep everything in my Google Drive and it's all organized under art history and it's just, to be honest, it's a mishmash of stuff. And um, so if we wanted to teach Greek art, I'd go in there and I've got a variety of different things that I can pull from. Um, uh, but let's see here, the art, art vocabulary for art history. I'm sorry, for the Greek. I've got my rubric uh, for the overall. So when I say rubric, each unit 
or what this would be for each unit of art history in my visual communications class I have to teach five units and each one would be I just have to pick you know a, a movement and um, and then it's worth like 200 points where normal projects I give them 20 points so they have a lot more to do and what's really been hard for me is is uh, getting them uh, getting creating an assignment that's interesting um so if we go into my classroom i can show you hang on just a second i'm gonna have to go into my archives uh visual communications and i wish they organized these better but let's see uh, art history uh here it is so for impressionism let's go down to the first one so for ancient greek art that's the first one that i i give to them um, and here, I, I, this year, I just had them do it on a Google Doc. I've, had, I've done it all kinds of different ways, using slides, using um, all kinds of different ways, where they would create a magazine cover based on the art, you know, history or whatever. I've done all sorts of different things. And, and then I've got the resources here, videos they can watch to, to glean information from. I even created a layout as like their art director saying, if you, you, I want you to set it up in this style and I don't want it to be normal I like you to think about you know doing the numeration differently and you know that kind of thing I really wanted to try and create it as as an, a design project not just let's write an essay on Greek art so that that's been my my challenge so um so that is essentially what I what I do for each unit and then we got the renaissance period and then I've got impressionism this past year, I didn't get through, I didn't get past three units of it. It was just really tough. It was tough and it, it dragged on. Some of my students took an entire month to get through this. Uh, it was terrible. So in any event, the resources that I use, I've got this, let's see here, this one here, sorry. This is a Padlet that I put together and I sort of, I'm still adding to it, but if you go over to uh greek art i've got all the videos that i that you could possibly imagine or that i could find that were relevant um and that didn't drone on and on and on i mean like there are tons of videos out there but we can easily lose lose their attention um you know what i mean so i'm just just going off of my own experience what i what what might you know keep or lose my attention and so that, that's really where I am with with history with um, with art history and Greek. I'm sorry, not Greek. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> graphic design history. I was going to touch on that real briefly. I, I've got a, another Padlet where I keep graphic design pioneers and I've got like 60 plus. I've got close to 70 of them here in hopefully alphabetical order. Not all at the end here. I, I have to organize these, but uh and they're from you know some are some are current some are um you know passed away so they're from all all different nationalities races whatever it's all the different people that i can possibly find from around the world that do graphic design that that contributed to the history of design hmm. Hmm. so that that's basically what i do uh, i also have another padlet for professional portfolios that are current day pe you know people um and all of that and that kind of ties into you know contemporary design obviously Gra in uh, college i took one course in art, art history so all of my knowledge of art history comes from what i teach my students right <laughs> or anything that i research on my own and so i'm not really strong in my knowledge of of art history i don't feel confident so that's really why i wanted to have this conversation i'd like to hear what you guys do and, and what you know how you organize your programs so um, I'm going to stop I have, talking. <laughs> I have a graphic history of graphic design unit. I'm happy to share. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Well, okay. Do you have it set up for screen share? Yeah, it will. If it's not, let me make sure. There okay. you go. Go for it. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So, um, so I designed mine last spring of 2020 when we suddenly went to completely remote with no structure, no plan, and so the whole thing is designed to be um pretty independent and pretty free choice because at that point school was optional 
I just wanted to <laughs> make sure that kids would actually do something. And then I repeated it again this spring because we were doing a hybrid and to keep kids in school and out of school engaged, um, it was just like perfect. Um, I also kind of do it towards the end of the year. Um, I, I know a lot of people like to open with the history of graphic design, but my thinking is until you've gone and tried it and you've like sketched something and you've talked to a client and you've tried to make something new, you don't really understand what you're looking at. Um, so, so I do mine towards the end of the year. So, um, so that like, you know, in backwards order, of course, because Google Classroom. Um, so I made a really fast slideshow that my computer is being very slow. And this was grabbed from resources around the web. And I'm strong on art history because I was a, a fine arts major and then week on graphic design history. So I kind of had to go teach myself too. Um, so I start with cave painting and early alphabets and things like that. Then we go to the invention of paper, um, both in Asia and Europe. And then we go to movable type, industrial revolution and the printing press. And then I have like a, okay, now, now we have the career of graphic design. Um, so then we get into Art Nouveau, um, which is pretty familiar, Futurism, um, Dada, uh, Packet Still or Modern Pictorialism, mm -hmm. uh, Russian Constructivism, great, um, Bauhaus and De Still, and Swiss posters, wartime posters, which kind of combine a lot of different, like there's Art Nouveau, you know, there's Russian constructivism, um, the growth in America and contemporary and then digital design. So like, that's, that's it. That's the direct instruction that I do. Yeah. Um, and then they have to take a quiz on it. It can be open slideshow. There's also a PDF, which I would love your Padlet because this is kind of something I grabbed from another teacher and I don't think it's very comprehensive. It's not very interesting to them. Um, and then they take a, a Google quiz, a Google form quiz, and then they choose what they want to do, what they want to research. Um, so they, I give them this. Um, which is a grid with guiding questions, my findings, my sources. So type what you read, um, copy and paste the URL where you found it. I have some resources, but again, I'd love to direct them to more. Um, they have to create a gallery of images and then something to the, in today's design world that uses that, um, that style. Um, and then they have to make a slideshow because as you mentioned, um, I don't want to grade art history papers and I don't want to teach them how to write it. Um, so they get a template where they get to style it and then fill it in with like, that, again, guiding questions and they, they get a copy and they get to make it. And I have an example for them um, that I did about surrealism, just they could, which is not one of the topics they could choose, so that they could see an example of what I would want the slideshow to maybe look like, you know. And then they have to do their own artwork in the style of, and they can choose any medium. Um, they just have to think about purpose, and they can't copy anything. Mm -hmm. um, so these are some examples that I've gotten in the past. Um, like I'm going to do digital design. So I'm going to make a, a poster for the video game I'm programming. I'm going to make a propaganda poster for milk. Um, and I really let them, and again, this is designed for when they were stuck at home. Um, so, you know, I got like <laughs> the weirdest, like, you know, crayon drawings and, um, stuff like that. It's like, I, I, I don't care. I really don't care. Like the fact that you're like making art is really what I want. Um, and then I put all the slideshows into folders and then they have to go look at another kid's slideshow and just type what they learned from it. And that's that. And um, 
there's like very little rubric. Like if you do the research, I give you 50 points. If you, because again, it was designed for optional school. Um, and I'm not, you know, I just want you to do it. So it's not like super like gotcha grading. Just, yeah. just get in there, see what you learn. And I always learn something new too, whenever kids do it, so. Right, great. That's cool. awesome. Yeah, I think the, the 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 really the most beneficial learning that I've done from my art history, you know, the, the all the art history that I've ever learned or, or studied is has come from when I actually integrate that into the work that I'm doing. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I learn a lot when I study this stuff, and that's great. But when I'm doing a design that's got to be set in an Art Nouveau style, I have to look at Art Nouveau and figure out what they're doing and how I can bring that into my work. And I learn a lot just by doing that. And, pulling in yeah. what works hmm. yeah we also get into like really interesting conversations about by knowing your art your design history you know kind of like what library of emotions you want to pull from so like if you look at any public health campaign right now you're going to find elements from world war ii propaganda posters you're going to find large text with a snappy slogan you're going to find a large figure whether it's like a big black and white person looking haunted saying you know yeah. prevent HIV um, or like a smiling nurse, like get your vaccine. You know, there's going to be a large figure, a bold set of text, and then smaller text underneath telling you what to do. And it, so like, if you know, you need to convince people to take an action for the public good, you pull from this library. Meanwhile, if you want people to feel luxurious, you're going to pull from like an art nouveau library. So, mm -hmm. so knowing your design, like people are automatically triggered because we know this stuff. You know, we know um, that like Dada collages are like crazy and revolutionary. So if you want people to feel crazy on your album cover, you're gonna do like wacky collages. So like just knowing that you can like do 90% of the work of communicating a concept to people, with, you know, just by picking from a style. So. Right, exactly. Thank you, Ali. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Um, does anybody else want to jump in, talk about how what they do or what they want to do, or what, what you guys, you know, uh, maybe anything that you want to cover? Anything else you want to cover specifically? Other than that, what I, what I want to do is, um, I thought I, I would jump into showing you the the resources that I have here as far as the books um, that I have. There are tons of research. There are, uh, there are a lot of websites out there, but I love leaning on like real books uh, every now and then. So uh, let me just show you what I've got as far as this uh, this graphic design book right here. Look at what I'm doing. Okay, now obviously I'm not going to read uh, page by page. This is actually a very visual kind of a uh, book uh, that doesn't. It has a lot of text in it, but it's really kind of a like I said, visual history. And it's kind of weird the way they they broken it up. Hang on a minute. Oh, prehistory of graphic design. So they talk about um, they talk about what happened, what was happening sociologically, you know, and economically, uh, politically, in in that time period, and then they show you examples of work from each time period. So, sorry, bear with me. Here we go. So starting in 1890. Um, they just go ahead and just show you examples. Uh, we've got great examples of the Art Nouveau style. We've got um, you know all kinds of uh, Victorian uh, typography and examples of you know that kind of stuff, all right? And then here, so this is a great book. Um, unfortunately, uh, these pictures are really really small. But what they do is this whole thing is just without any context, just what happened in 1890, 1891, 1892, 1893. And some of them are kind of interesting to graphic design, like Gra uh, Wrigley's company introduced its juicy fruit and spearmint flavor chewing gum in 1893. The Independent Labor Party founded here, and they've got that logo here, but they've got other things that are more political or other you know, sociological. So it's, it's a great book and it just goes, it's, it's an expensive book. That's, that's the thing. But it goes page by page. 
and um, just gives example after example. It's really, really great. So here's all 1891. Okay, more examples in 1891. And then move on wait, somewhere. I missed 1892, somewhere in there, but 1893, and so on. And it goes on and on all the way. Here's um, 1929. It's just a fantastic book. And I don't know if you could find it in a library anywhere, but if you guys can get your hands on it, it's a, it's a great, great book. Um, I don't know. The, actually, um, title and author. Yeah. So the title and author author is so the uh, is graphic design volume one, 1890 to 1959. Jens Mueller and Julius Wiedemann. Um, the, uh, what is it, the publisher is Tashin, T-A-S-C-H-E-N. If you go to the Tashin website, here, let me move this up here, it's Tashin right there. If you go to the Tashin website, I've found a ton of, they've got a library of really, really great books, um, but they've got a fantastic collection of books. And then, of course, um, we've got the Meg's book. I, I recommend this one. I... Um, this is the history of graphic design again, uh, but it's, it's, let me just go through and show you the, the table of contents. The way they set it up is uh, they do a prologue, the invention of writing and alphabets and all of that. And they touch on the Asian contribution, illuminated manuscripts, um, things like that. I love that era. I just love talking about illuminated manuscripts. Um, in college, we did some awesome uh, projects where we used, you know, gold foiling and stuff like that. I just love that's that's the way that I design my classes really is I think about what I did in college and I sort of bring that stuff into my into my class. Um, so in any event, a graphic renaissance, a bridge to the 20th century, uh, the modernist era, which is um, influence of modern art, the new new language of form, Bauhaus, things like that. Um, the age of information, that's really the, the last part. I'll be honest, let me, let me check the published date on this book. 2016, so it's fairly current, a little bit behind the times, but not by much, uh, five or six years now. So uh, the age of information, they do touch on the digital revolution and things like that. So that, that's really what I look for in my history books. If I'm getting a, a book, I want it to be as current as possible, obviously, but so that's Meg's. And then one more book that I've got, and no, I have not read through everything. I just use them sort of just to, as a guide, and I go in and grab what I need when I need it. Um, but once again, in this one, this is, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, that, that was uh, Philip B. Meg's and Alston W. Purvis. This is the sixth edition. The publisher is Wiley. Wiley for Meg's uh, History of Graphic Design. This one is the third edition by Stephen Eskelson of Graphic Design His uh, A History. And they talk about, let me tell you what they have in here. Once again, writing and printing in China. So the Asian uh, contribution, right? The Industrial Revolution and the rise of urban mass culture. Uh, European newspapers and the law. Um, the history, I'm sorry, the arts and crafts movement, the advent of graphic design, and, and on and on. So they do touch on all, you know, all things graphic design, but they integrate in this book more art history. So they talk about Art Nouveau in Scotland, um, Celtic manuscripts, uh, Art Nouveau in Germany, the decline of Art Nouveau, so on, revolutions in design, uh, Bauhaus, new typography, um and so on you know there's art deco over here so like i said it, this one really integrates the 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 art movements into the the graphic design history because the, that's as it should be right um and then the last book i have here like i said in the beginning well I actually i don't know if i mentioned this or not but so the 50 years of illustration is by lawrence zegan and carolyn roberts and the reason i brought this up was because i mean it's 50 years of illustration so it's a little historical look back at uh you know great examples of of illustration such as uh milton glazer and his um, um bob dylan design 
uh, these <laughs> designs from the underground comics that they used to do, right? Uh, album covers from the 60s and 70s. Uh, and what I've done is they, they're broken up into time periods. So this particular book here from the 70s, we can go back and look at things from the 80s, the 90s, and so on. And you can see where the difference in design was and where they integrate various art history or art movements uh, into their works. So anyway, so this is a this is actually a really great book. Um, the, a lot of these artists are kind of unknown, as far as I can tell, <laughs> or they were unknown to me. So are you all going back 100% uh, in person? Or are you, you still doing some hybrid or? Yeah, I haven't heard. Um, from what I understand in Oregon, they are planning for everybody to be back in person five days a week, but masks are going to be required K through 12. That's where it stands today. Yeah. That might change. Right. Same, same for my school district, but we don't actually have a plan and we don't know how they're going to go to lunch. Like we, we don't know what that looks like yet, but yeah. Um, and they have the option to do the remote only program in the district. So I don't know if our numbers are gonna go down significantly. Ah. We'll see. Yeah, I, uh, we, we are doing uh, in-person. In fact, we have uh, Buena Vista High School is an all remote high school. I did their logo in fact, but <laughs> it's a brand new school. They actually converted a, a, a high school a whole high school to this remote high school. So anyway, anybody that wants to do that can go over there. So we will not be zooming. Uh, thank goodness, unless we're doing these PLCs. But um, <laughs> my son, by the way, who is um, a going into his senior year next year, or this coming year, he's at my school. And uh, he's in he's been in my design classes. Uh, um, he was a great student up until last year, he got two F's and a D on his transcript from this past year. Um, and so, I mean, it, it really just dissolved his, his, not his ability, but his, I don't know what it is. His, his motivation, desire, his desire. Motivation, thank yeah. You. And, and we found that we found that the separation drastically increased. We had A's and F's didn't have many middle, middle students. Right. And some of the students who desperately need that social interaction just did not know how to schedule their time, how to focus on their work, how to get stuff done. And then there was a few other students, you know, my more autistic students, they loved it. Oh, my gosh. They could create their own setting and their own environment, and they were off to the races. And then there was a few, probably about 5%, maybe 10%, who were like, you know what? I can get ahead of the game. Right. This is awesome. I'm going to do my research. I'm going to do my everything. I'm going to fill out the forms. We had a, a lot of early graduates this year compared to previous years because they just got it done. They're like, I'm, I'm going on. I'm out of here. And so you have this, the students really needed, I hope they learned how they learn by going through last year mm -hmm. and, and, and addressing those things, which kind of brings me back to day to your thing where you said the typical way that you did history of graphic design wasn't really effective. And, and was it because that became more like a history class rather than an art class or was it that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly the feeling that I got. Like, okay, now we're gonna teach history. <laughs> <laughs> we're not gonna do in 1865. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, that, that's why I integrated the, the magazine cover. I'm thinking, well, we have to do something. We got to bring it into the world of design in some way. So what I do is I actually, when I'm taught, teaching art history, I, I look around the world and just like take pictures when I'm in the, the grocery store of, you know, labels that have Art Nouveau or whatever, you know, this the different styles. This is how you can make money knowing about the art movements, right? <laughs> so... I try, I try to integrate real life stuff into my classes whenever possible. So and I think that's that's kind of what's bouncing around in my head right now because I don't really do a history of graphic design, and I kind of I pull in different art movements mm -hmm. and I relate those art movements to the style and composition and colors for them to use for a particular project. But this discussion is helping me to figure out how to be more intentional mm -hmm. with that. Um, and, and I, and Dave, you hit it on the, you know, 
these kids really need high practicality and a way to connect the dots of what is meaningful for them. Mm-hmm. And for me, you know, I'm a little beyond their age group. So it's a real struggle for me to figure out what connects with them. Yeah. I yeah. That. So I said, I do history like towards the end of the year. Um, during the year, if we do a project that has a, ind- well, everything we do has an industry model. So like when we do travel posters or travel postcards, I'll teach them the history of that very particular part of it. Hmm. Um, and like, you know, it's like a very niche um, thing. And then when we get to the history of graphic design unit, I'll say, you know, we've talked about the concept of history a lot. Here's like, you know, uh, here's the whole thing and think about projects we did and which ones you liked and like which, you know, which eras you wanted to know more about. So yeah, so most of the projects we do, I'll do like a small piece of history so that they're rooted in like that particular project. But then at the end, when we have an idea that, oh, this stuff matters, that's when we do the full presentation. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I do teach uh, computer science principles and um, we teach uh, like computer history. Uh, I do a little segment on mm-hmm. that. Um, this probably compared to what y'all do for graphic design is very probably real easy, but we do a storyboard and mm-hmm. um, I do a timeline and um, that usually kind of it gets the kids, they have to do some research and figure out what they would put and then they have to pull the innovations that came through through um, computer science and they put it on the timeline. Um, that's probably the only thing that we do that's historical mm. um, when it comes to what I've taught in the past. So, um, so yeah, I'm not much help, but okay. I'm learning. <laughs> no, that, that's actually a really good idea um, because one of the other things that really helped me to appreciate history is to get the connections of what was happening in the world at a particular time. I just learned last night that during our, right, right around the time of our civil war, Italy was going through a civil war. And, the, and right before that, the great Irish potato famine happened. And all of these things relate to each other globally. And obviously we all agree that that relates to art because art comes out of what we experience. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like, and so I try to connect those dots with kids because it's like what's happening globally really does impact our world. Um, and, but then you can really get into the weeds pretty easily. Right. But the whole idea of a storyboard <laughs> and connecting the dots, boy, that's just, that's a great, that's a really great way to do it. Um, my colleagues in the photography department, uh, when they do their history of photography assignment, um, they will turn their entire rooms into a visual timeline. So kids will get assigned like a photographer um, and then they have to, and the kids have to create it. They have to decide, no, mine, mine's before yours or after yours. And again, as I said, I've never taught this to a full classroom of in-person kids, but um, handing the, the wall space over to them and you know, choose <laughs> um, like a, a piece of design from this time period and then your you know, version and we can just hang those all up in order around the room um, could be really cool too. That's really neat, yeah. Or down a hallway, that would be pretty interesting. Mm, Yeah. We did have, um, this was in elementary, we had um, one of our teachers, he took a hallway and um, I guess it was the cave paintings um, Mm -hmm. and he turned the hallway into a cave and then had the kids do cave paintings in the hallway and it was amazing. And of course, you know, he made it dark. So you had to go in there with flashlights and um, and the kids just ate it up. They loved it. So I um, thought that was kind of neat. So instead of the the hunt for the, the buffaloes, it's the hunt for the nerds, right? <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> That's pretty it's funny. Cool. The yeah. last go, right? That's yes. Cool. Mm-hmm. That's in fact, I am on the topic of t- uh, doing your walls. I actually, let me take this out real quick. I am. The whole month of August, I'm doing this. I'm actually, this whole wall space that I have, all of these, that's for my student work. Uh, mm-hmm. These are plastic, uh, sorry, plexiglass, like retail signs. They're all going to go onto that wall. And this is going to be in panels 
the graphic design, uh, the history of graphic design, mm. all from, I guess, mm. way down there, all the way up here. I got a lot of work to do. But um, mm -hmm. that's, that's partially what this conversation is going to help me with uh, is figuring out, well, what's, you know, how, how do I do this? <laughs> so Anything? I was just, yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, I wasn't purposely trying to be quiet here, but I don't do a ton of um, history either, like Michelle was, you know, like, because I'm just, I'm building my curriculum as I go. I have kind of a different situation where I just have them per semester. And mm -hmm. so I'm trying to squeeze in, you know, everything about graphic design. And then also we've been, um, I started teaching them Illustrator and InDesign and I, <laughs> I meet with them on Zoom once a week for like an hour and a half. And so that's kind of like my big time to be able to do all that. So what I started doing was for um, each of my presentations that I give for everything, I just do kind of like a little brief thing at the front where I would, um, I'd use my Padlet. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> Um, and I just pick a graphic design person, throw on like three of their pieces, say like, you know, here's uh, when they lived and something interesting about them. And then um, I, I do kind of like what you were saying, Allie, like you wait and do kind of more of an in-depth history a little bit later once they kind of have a more of a grasp of it. And so usually I throw that in when we start talking about um, the printing press and movable type and then kind of go on to the different styles and stuff like that but I like your idea of assignments that kind of I've been trying to figure that out like how you tie in an assignment to that history because it is important but sometimes you feel like there's just so many things that are important to really understanding how to do graphic design that you're like yeah. where do you start and where do you end and and also like understanding the motivations of the kids who signed up for your class. Like, did yes. they sign up because they want a career in graphic design? Did they sign up because they have to, Easy. you know? So it's <laughs> like, how far do you push it right. um, to keep their interest, but also make sure that, you know, they're, it's like rigorous and, and, and industry standard. Right. Yeah, and you have different kids too, because I've had a few kids where they are nerding along right with me, and it's so much fun. But then there's the other kids going. You know, I have uh, I teach in an academy, so for the most part, my students are joining because they want a. I don't think they they are necessarily thinking career, but they want a pathway. They want to stick with this, you know, direction. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not just an elective for a lot of my students, but. Um, I do get students that are like, I need to fill a spot. Let me take that class. It looks easy. I, for regardless of their motivation, I teach everybody the same way. Since I come from industry, mm -hmm. I talk to them like they're learning to go into industry. And so, you know, every single thing is about making money. It's about, you know, how, how you spend your time wisely, how you talk with clients. It's all, it's mm -hmm. all like professional base. That's regardless of whether they're in just for the elective or not. Mm -hmm. And I haven't had anybody go, yeah, this is too much for me. <laughs> so, fortunately. Yeah. <laughs> that's usually how I approach it also, which has been, um, that's where it's been difficult. Like um, a lot of people who are art teachers, they come at it from like a good, you know, here's a good way to educate people. And I'm like, well, how about <laughs> here's a good way to work if you're in it. And so it's hard to find that good balance. It's been really good to be a part of this group and see how different people have handled that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so in my folders, there's like the distance learning version of like midway critique where there's like a shared slideshow. Um, and then if we're in the classroom, I'll have them actually just put their work up on their screen and then um, leave a piece of paper and then walk around and leave feedback. Um, we do like a T chart, like they, I like, maybe we could. Um, and so the, the, the slideshow is a distance alternative to that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something I like to incorporate as well is the critique process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we usually, I try to use like a discussion board is what I've kind of used because um, we use Canvas also 
Um, and then they post their final piece or whatever, wherever we are mm -hmm. along the way. And then I require them to make comments on each other's work. And then mm -hmm. when we have our live session, they share it because I'm like, this part is really important, guys. And some of them are really shy about that. It's kind of interesting, even on Zoom. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Um, I build my critique process. Like we start the first assignment or the second assignment that they do is like a, a paper um, lines activity. And they get into groups and they walk around with an envelope of little stars and they like put stars underneath the papers of the ones that they think did the assignment the best. So it's like, it's a group decision. You're not responsible for the final outcome. You know, no one can see what you said. Um, and the artist is in a, another group somewhere, you know, not hearing your feedback and to the end of the year where they um, have a big project. And then I bring in guests, um, they have to do a, a the exterior boxes and they have to do a, a pitch, a marketing pitch. And then I bring in guest judges. They have to like, in person, explain their work to a stranger and take questions. So it's like, a, it's a gradual process because they do not know how to do critique. Right. right. Yep. But I didn't know how to do critique until college. And I had my first college critique and it was soul crushing. Right. Um, <laughs> so I'm like, no, I'm doing you guys a favor. I know. We're doing this life. the soft way. Yes, mm -hmm. this is easy. Like, These are your friends. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and yeah. teaching you a structure for how to give and take <clears throat> critique mm -hmm. gracefully. Yes. Um, you know, you're sitting in a, in a conference room with uh, advertising executives critiquing your ads and the logo designs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they don't Perfect. care. <laughs> yeah. Just well, they're paying you, right? right? If you're not up to snuff. Yeah. You know, it, what's interesting when it comes to critique, because I, I try to do that with my students too, and it is, for them, it's this image of being slaughtered um, mm -hmm. and taking everything totally personally. Um, right. I've been in a Toastmasters group for about 10 years. Now, yeah. when I first started and they evaluated my first, you know, prepared speech, I was, I was like, yeah, but no, wait, you know, and I wanted to come back. And then I finally mm -hmm. thought, you know, they're telling me what I'm doing well. And they're also telling me where I need to improve. And so mm -hmm. that's what I bring to the critiques. It's like, let's find what's working in yeah. this project. And then let's say, if I were to do it, I would, I might try this, or I might try that. And it really does help to kind of soften the blow um, and, and to learn through the process. And it's also important for them to understand that what people are saying, it's not, they're not attacking you, it's their experience of whatever it is they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it doesn't make it invalid. It's like, when I see something, I, I either like, those colors don't hit me right. I'm not saying you're a horrible person because you can't deal with color correctly, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so they have to understand what they're hearing. It's not, beating up, it's helping to figure out what works best, right? When we do our first walk around the room, teach art critique, um, I don't let them go back to their seats. I you have to stand in a circle when everybody's done and like talk about the process. And I do this like um, example of the over-emotional freshman who can't handle critique, um, you know, as like a what not to do. Like you need to sit, you need to go back to your seat. You need to read every comment quietly. You need to circle or star three things that you can learn from and you need to not freak out. And I'll, cause I had this one kid sometime and I'll be like, green, I hate green. And this guy told me he's green. And I, I just go over the top. And what it does is it makes it so when they sit down, they don't want to be that freshman, you know, whether a freshman or a senior. Um, and I will still like in spring, we'll be doing critiquey stuff and I'll have a kid go green, I hate green, you know, <laughs> making fun of me for making fun of them. but. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I miss being around kids. This whole Zoom thing sucks. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I, um, I once did a uh, personal growth training back in the, like, the 90s or whatever, but a long time ago. One of the things that they taught us, and I bring this into the conversation about critiquing, is that, um, you know, if one person says, okay, and I, I actually, I, I know I shouldn't be saying this to the kids, but I did this year. <laughs> I said, if one person calls you an ass, you know, okay, all right. You know, that's their opinion. If two people call you an ass, you, know, you might think about it, but if three or more people call you an ass, you might want to buy a saddle. 
<laughs> so if and basically just to say if more people you know that it's important to get critiques to get feedback to get their opinions what do you see what do you see and then yeah. pick the you know pick and choose you don't have to make every single change that's told to you but pick the things that make the most sense right anyway. and i use the three part if three people hate the color you probably need to switch the color right you know <laughs> and the joy of digital design is there is a history panel do it right. evaluate it with your own eyes call them over and say hey is this what you meant and then undo it if it doesn't work they're not fortune tellers they can't say oh if you change it to pink it will be better they're saying maybe try pink try pink <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. undo it if you don't like it it's not yet. right exactly mm -hmm. but i mean life skills man <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to just offer this up. We can continue or we can wrap it up. I think we covered a lot of stuff. If you guys have any other topics you'd like to talk about, we cert certainly can. Or we can just say, enjoy the rest of our Sunday. <laughs> yeah, this went out to three different uh, teachers groups. So um, there it's okay. the, yeah, uh, the three groups that are included are the digital media and de design art teachers, the one called graphic design teachers, and then there's one that's graphic design and digital media teachers. So wow. <laughs> I belong to all of them. And so I invited everybody. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing this, David. Yeah. And yeah, thank your you. information all the way through has been a huge help for me. So thank you. Um, I don't think I would have tackled this if it hadn't been for you. So thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe welcome. I won't be saying that at the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> They check well, back in October. Yeah, right. <laughs> I do it for a selfish, selfish reason. I need to help myself. So, <laughs> yeah. Helping me, I'm helping you. Hopefully. All right. Anyway. All right, you guys. Well, uh, let's let's call it. Have a wonderful Sunday. Thanks for being a part of it. And um, you will find the recording up uh, probably in the next day or two. So. Oh crap! We are being recorded. <laughs> And that's going in right there. Right there. <laughs> That'll be the preview. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Take guys. Care. Have a great afternoon. You too.